This is the Five Point Play Podcast, the Die Hard Duke Basketball Fans Podcast. Whew, what a weekend. Coming off of CTC. Yes, we braved the rain, braved the storms, then the clear skies hit. Cooper Flagg was in the building. I mean, I think he got more love than any of our current players, to be honest with you. Yeah. But it, it, was, a, it was a hell of a night, and um, we got a, a special guest right now, uh, Ben from... Uh, from Duke Wisdom, the guy has about 10,000 followers on Twitter, just shy of that. But, I mean, for for what he's doing, uh, kind of started out as a Duke recruiting tool on, on Twitter, and, and now he's um, just living the dream as a Carolina student, but a Duke fan. <laughs> man, man, come on, man. Talk, talk to us a little bit. What, what, what is that one? Man, it's, it's, a, it's a weird dynamic when you, you grow up your whole life a Duke fan and – you make your way uh, over to, to UNC and you, you don't, you don't ever, that's not nothing that I ever expected to do. Um, but you become one, I wanted to become a sports writer. I wanted to become a journalist. And so move to go to Carolina made sense, but it's definitely a bit odd trying to balance like uh, covering both of these teams, you know, and uh, sort of the, the implicit biases that you have growing up uh, around one team and then going to the other school and you got friends that are like going to the game at UNC and you're like, in, in your mind, you're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to stay home and watch the Duke game. But like, you know. <laughs> I'm sure that goes over well. Um, how, who was your favorite player growing up? How did you become a Duke fan? Oh man! Well, I became a Duke fan because I think my of my grandfather. And funnily enough, the first game I ever watched was like in two thousand nine or something like that against Maryland. It was John Shire. John Shire was who made me a Duke fan, without a doubt. And so it's super cool to get the full circle moment to see him become the head coach because he's a big reason why I became a Duke fan. And, and when, did you, when did you realize that you were kind of like a diehard lunatic type of fan like we are here? Man, I guess it was probably like uh, 2011 season and stuff. You know, I'm a younger kid at that time. And right. I, every time they lost, I was I was just bawling my eyes out. I was like about to say, real tears. That's when you know. When you're crying right. real tears, you know. <laughs> That's right. But uh, you were there for, uh, for Countdown, right? Absolutely. What were your first initial thoughts of, of – countdown and and kind of the program that they put on yeah so I, I i thought it was a great change of pace from last year because last year and i wrote something about this last year but i thought that it was a little bit lacking uh some of the seats were kind of empty last season and you know first year coach with shire not a big surprise but when this team had the success that they had at the end of last season and i think people are really buying into the shire era and i think you saw that you saw the recruits coming in you you saw the love you felt the love and I thought the production value of it was like really raised up. I thought like the introduction of everything was one of the best ones I've seen. And I've been to almost every single countdown. So, Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, AC, you and I have been to a number of countdowns um, in, in, in the past. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I have to agree with Ben here that I, I think that this year they kind of stepped it up a little bit. And it wasn't just because, you know, we had Cooper Flag in the building. It was because right. people are really buying in to what John Shire is building and Mm -hmm. and what what he's all about. And I think it kind of like came to fruition a little bit at the very end of Countdown when, you know, the students call (laughs) John Shire over to sit with them. Right. He does, and he's like holding up the, you know, the baby, oh, baby, oh, baby. And, you know, the guy in the background, my favorite part about the entire scene was the guy in the background was Cooper Flagg going nuts when John Shire was doing that. So, you know, kind of your overall first impressions of, of your latest countdown appearance. Yeah, I, no, I, I enjoyed it, man. It was a lot of fun. It had good energy. Uh, I know I saw on Twitter a lot of people were like, uh, the, fan, the fans weren't cheering for Coop when he walked by himself. That's because he walked. they were walking at a point where nobody could see him. Like, that's as soon as they got up to where the rest of the fans were, everybody went nuts outside. They were going nuts inside. It was fine, man. Yeah. Don't, don't buy into any of that stuff. If you guys are listening or seeing that on Twitter, do not worry about that. The fans were... Very hyped to see Cooper Flag walking around on campus and in the stadium. Believe me, but um, no, I mean they they had those they had the little the little banners that they brought down. I everybody was complaining about the telecast, the little screen that they had up, but they they had some cool graphics on the screen for the people who were actually in the building. Very um, neat. And just seeing some of the things they've done in the past, like I remember that one year they had they actually used the floor as the screen, which was kind of yeah. tight. Um, but no, 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 the production value was nice. They they gave. 
the women's basketball team some shine during CTC a lot more than they ever have in the past. Mm-hmm. It, overall, it was a good event. I think I think I agree with some of the people online, some fans online who are like, I want to see more because it's you know it's a midnight madness event, and historically those things used to be it used to be crazy. Depend on what school you're at or whatever, but it used to be nuts what they would bring out sometimes for these midnight madness events. But I mean, ultimately, it's a lot of it's fan service. The players are, you know, they're kind of like whatever. It's it's exciting for them, but I think they just kind of want to get the night over with. <laughs> if, if we're be really being honest, but yeah. um, I, I think it's overall is a good event. And are there some things they could add? Sure. Like next year, we got boatloads of shooters coming in. Like you could have a three point shooting contest, and I think will be pretty competitive. I think, but I don't know. They they toyed with that idea before and never did it. So I can't imagine they do it again or do it now this time. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, over, overall, I, I think um, a lot of the uh, reactions that some of the fans had are warranted. Some of them are not, like you said. If you weren't there, yeah. believe me, I was right in the line on the blue walk. I, I could hear and see with my own two eyes, mm-hmm. you know, the love that Cooper Flag and all the players. I mean, all I want to just yeah. focus on, you know, on on him. But um, obviously, he's kind of like the lightning rod for the whole thing. But you know, there was a ton of love there for for him. D, that was your first countdown to craziness. It was. I mean, you, you were hyped when you were there. When you walked out of there, what was kind of your overall takeaway? I mean, I, I, well, first of all, let's just talk. The, the players came out first, and then the recruits came out. The players also went to the basketball court that was set up across from our tent. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, they, they took some, they put some shots up. And nobody sees the photos of the the mass of fans running across the, right. the parking lot to go see them. So the people who stayed and watched Cooper Flag and them come down the walkway were cheering. The mm-hmm. other ones were chasing the current men's program to watch them take jumpers on the court, the outside court. <clears throat> yep. But my reactions walking out, production value, like you guys said, ramped up. I mean, it was really the the shadows with the the big white sheet things was that was really neat mm-hmm. um they, the, they gave the female club their shine all day long um introduced them told us to clap it up for them. i mean it, it the whole day was just absolutely centered around you know like you said fan fans you know bringing mm-hmm. in the fans the place was absolutely packed i don't think there was an empty seat there i didn't see one yeah. Um, and walking out, I, I just I couldn't stop thinking about Reeves. To be quite honest, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just I mean, yeah. PK, you asked me a question, I got to answer it. <laughs> but Reeves, yeah. I mean, it was a great. It it it, it was everything I expected. Plus, yeah. I like D. I'll keep it with you here. I mean, I I said that Reeves is first team all countdown to craziness two years. You know, two dominating performances in, in Countdown. Um, this year, obviously, expectations are a little bit higher for, for Reeves, whereas last year there weren't, you know, kind of any expectations for him. Anything that he would give us would be a plus. A lot of people, myself included, thought he would redshirt that year. So you said it. What are your expectations coming out of there? Have they changed? Are you expe- expecting a little bit more? I mean, I've seen – on Twitter, I've seen a lot of talk about he's the fifth starter now. Um, I so we privately, as a you know, as friends and a podcast, talked about this. What what should we expect from Reeves? And we use the term serviceable minutes, right? F- mm-hmm. Ten to fifteen serviceable minutes. You don't need to score this or that. Just serviceable minutes. The five foul things. I think we can throw that out because this dude. It, it might be hard to keep him off the floor the way. If he plays with the same intensity and the same energy that he ran that scrimmage with, when we were talking about who's going to take yeah. Foster's minute, it, it might be Reeves. Like he might be that fifth guy, Seriously? and I and I'd be okay with it. Like uh, he's bigger, stronger, and faster. Like whatever he did in the summer worked. Um, he's bouncy. He he doesn't play with his back. You know his his he doesn't front the basket like he did. I mean, he's just – he's a better basketball player, and I think it might be times 100. Yeah, Ben, um, what I thought, you know, the more I watched the, the the scrimmage kind of unfold and the way they were kind of 
Flip used Reeves very similar to the way that he used Lively, where, you know, he can throw in the lobs, he can kind of draw the attention and then, you know, dump it into him. I thought to me that um, that was Coach Shire's way of saying, hey, look, I'm going to put you with Roach, I'm going to put you with Proctor, I'm going to put you with Flip, and I'm going to let you kind of work with that squad to kind of gain, you know, jump up his confidence and and also be um, like, hey, this this is the role that you're going to play. Is that kind of where you took it, or like, how did you feel where you played? Do you do you have any like different opinion on the way you went into countdown with Reeves and the way you came out of it, or is it pretty much still the same for for your thought? Real quick, let's put a pause on that because we got a guest here that I want to get in real fast. Who we got, Darren? What's up? Oh, there we go. What's good, bro? Hey, welcome to the show. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on, man. We were just talking about Countdown to Craziness. So uh, that's what we, we wanted to get you on to kind of get your reaction about just what you guys kind of experienced. You don't have to, obviously, you're not going to give us what you're going to get, but we just want to hear what you got to say, man, about your experience there. You, have, you, have you been to Countdown before? Oh, no, that was my first time. Okay. Yeah, so your overall thoughts on, on how it went and – you know, obviously, it, it seemed pretty exciting, and you guys got a lot of love from from the crazies. Was it kind of what you had hoped to be? Like, it was it you know a little bit more? Like, what, what was your kind of attitude going into it? I mean, yeah, it was real fun. Uh, my main goal was like trying to build relationships with uh like Cooper and Isaiah, Khan, uh, mm-hmm. BJ, and like obviously I already have a relationship with Pat. Right. So um, I mean, that was fun. Like getting to know them. Like I know how great they are, but on the court, off the court, they're like the real cool guys. So that was good to know. And um, I mean, countdown was really fun. Like, you know, growing up a Duke fan, it's kind of crazy to like hear the crazies like call your name and tell them to sit with you. Kind of like right. gave me chills a little bit. So I mean, yeah, it was real fun. And like the team looked great. <clears throat> and uh, the overall weekend weekend was real fun. Nice, nice. So I, I thought that was a pretty cool thing that your essentially your whole class outside of potential class outside of Dylan was able to come down for countdown. Was that kind of a thing that you guys planned together? Was that the coaches who put that together? How'd that kind of come about? Uh, I think it was a little bit of both. Like, I think the coaches put it together, but, like, we all wanted to be there together at the same time. Awesome. Yeah, so, so are you doing a little bit of uh, recruiting on your side as well then? Um, especially, you know, you got Pat right next to you every day. Um, you know, so it's easy to do that recruiting. Are you trying to do the same thing with VJ? With Coop, you know, trying to you know kind of craft that class together because you know historically speaking, um, you know a lot of times when you hear you know Duke recruiting stories, it's you know you know that first commit, you know or that second commit, you know saying hey you know my goal is to get these other guys that I played AU ball with or other tournaments with and trying to bring them with me. Is that kind of your goal as well? Oh uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I would say. I don't really have to do too much of that for some of these people, some of these guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to say too much on that, but. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go. Uh, okay. Let's go. Okay. All right. I mean, yeah, Let's but go. for Pat, like, obviously, he kind of blew up over the summer. And, um, yeah. like, me and him have had a, a real close relationship, like, since we were, like, 10 or 11. So, um, you know, I think he's making a decision soon, and uh, it'll be fun to see where he uh, comes, goes. Nice, nice. Um. And one thing, one thing I wanted to kind of talk to, talk about was since I'm up here in the Northern Virginia area too, like it, it seems like Duke and PVI have a good relationship together. Is that something that's been kind of just coincidental that we've been getting guys from? The, obviously, PVI has great players. You're gonna get great players to come to your team, but is that is that coincidental or is that kind of one of those things that you know you kind of have like a little bit of a pipeline there? Not that you guys are being forced to go to Duke, but it's just you have that relationship built. Oh yeah, I was actually talking with Coach Rowe about this the other day. Uh... Like he said, like really, it just started with Roach. Like mm-hmm. the relationship with Duke started there, and then yeah, you know, after uh, Roach committed, like Coach was telling him about Trevor, mm-hmm. like how they need to recruit him, how good he can be. And then yep. he proved he proved himself enough to you know end up at Duke and he ended up doing really well. Same with Jeremy. So then, like when I came along, it was the same same story really. Like you know, you need to recruit this kid, and you know, Coach Shire uh, f- fell through on that, and he he could also trust Coach Rowe, like. At this point, if you if you send that many kids to Duke and they've all panned out well, if you gonna you're gonna trust the coach's word and trust that you know it will all pan out. So, 
We got anybody else uh, on the roster coming up this uh, next couple of years after you who might be uh, might be looking to do? Yeah, for sure. Who okay. you got? Who you got? Give, give us a couple names. Uh, Jordan Smith. He's like he's a rising sophomore. He, he's okay. real good, like really good, especially yeah. on defense. You know, really athletic guard. And uh, he, he was on. He goes to the Team USA mini camp. I think he's a five star, so he's nice. real talented. We also got some some young guys who hopefully they can get to that level too. That's what's up. Good to hear. Good to hear. <laughs> and then, yeah. So, yeah what are you gonna, What are you going to be working on? Sorry, TK, real quick. What are you going to be working on this season uh, at PBI? Just kind of working. Is there anything that Coach Shires kind of told you? Hey, coming into Duke, coming into your first off season at Duke, I want to see this. I want to see that because I, mean, I mean, you're known as a shooter. You're the best shooter in high school. I'm not going to take any other answers from that. Is there anything else he's like? Come in with this. Come in with that. The uh, main thing is like just killer mentality every game. You know, not some games, not some quarter, some plays. Like just right. keep the same mentality every game. And we I saw that I at that. Peach Jam, bro. Yeah, we saw like, that I did at that. Peach Jam, man. At Peach Jam. So now, like that's the standard for me. I can't, you know, lower my standard at all because now, you know, everybody knows what I can do on a daily basis. So just staying consistent with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said the killer mentality because that was actually going to be my question. Um, when Khan uh, committed a couple weeks ago. He kind of talked about, you know, having that color mentality as well. I feel like John Shire is trying to build a program with a lot of guys. He said the same thing about Jared McCain. You know, you kind of see all the TikTok stuff that he does. But once he gets on the court, he has the color mentality. You have the same thing with Philip House. You, you just talked about it. What is it about the guys that, that you've kind of grown to know that um, have not only committed to Duke, but – you know, the Jeremy Roaches, the Trevor Keels. What is it about the, the type of players that, you know, kind of go to Duke that all have that kind of mindset, kind of take us through that mindset that that it takes to, to be a player at Duke? I mean, yeah, like Duke is the biggest stage. Like the lights are always on you. And uh, I mean, like, honestly, like the fans are kind of ruthless sometimes. Like you have a bad game, you know, go on Twitter. It's kind of like <laughs> kind of rough on you up there. So, you know, you got to have a strong mindset and have a killer mentality because when things go wrong, you know, your confidence can't waver or any of that. You know, you got to, you know, stay who you are. And at the end of the day, also, like, if everybody has a killer mentality on the team, like, everybody's going to get better at the same time, you know. There's not going to be, like, a weak link or anything. Everybody's going to be pushing each other to get better. Yeah, for sure. Uh, ben, uh, Ben with Duke Wisdom, um, honestly, huge account. You do a lot of recruiting. That's kind of how you got your start. Um, go ahead and throw whatever questions you want out there. Yeah, man. I was. I'm. I'm just curious to know, like you, as a as a rising freshman next year, you're looking at all these player intros. You see Jared McCain breaking out the dances, Stanley Borden breaking out the song. Do you feel any pressure to do anything like crazy <laughs> for your intro next year? Oh uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not really like a type of guy to do some, to do something crazy. But yeah, I was definitely thinking about it. Like while I was there, what I'm gonna do? It's all gonna be like some some chill, some calm. You got any song song ideas? Uh, nah. Not yet. <laughs> yet, no. yet. You, got, you got a little bit of time to figure yeah, it out. Yeah, I was going to say, you got, you got a little bit. You got a little bit. Um, in, in terms of the, the, uh, the roster construction that John's trying to build for next year, uh, we kind of see it. You know, he wants to build the team around shooters. Yourself being, you know, an elite shooter, um, we already have a couple that we expect to be there, you know, next year at minimum, TJ Power, uh, Jaden Shoot. Um, you know, Alex is going to be a really good player. Knuth will obviously a, a really good shooter. Hopefully, Cooper Flag and, and others. What kind of team do you kind of see building right now for for your team next year, uh, offensively especially? Oh yeah, like the main thing is like you said, is shooting. But also like we're all unselfish. We all play the right way. Um, we can all pass the ball too. Uh, we're all good, good playmakers. Unselfish. We can all mm -hmm. shoot the ball really well. So I think like when we get rolling, it's gonna be hard to stop and uh, really fun to watch. Kind of following that up, did you get a chance uh, on this visit, or even you know, even through text or whatever else, to kind of build a little bit of a relationship with some of the current guys on the team that might be back next year? Oh uh, yeah, I did. Uh, my my first official is, or my official this year, um, in like early September. Mm -hmm. uh, I built a relationship with like all the freshmen. I was with them most of the time, and then uh, okay. this this weekend I was with. Like Mark, um, I was with most of the older guys, so okay. I don't know if they're gonna be back, but it'll be it'll right. be cool if they do come back. Yeah, yeah, oh, that'd be ridiculous if they came back. <laughs> you ain't lying. 
All right, this, I'm not asking who is going to commit or anything, but who had the most fun out of your group at Countdown while they were down there? Uh, honestly, I think we all had a lot of fun. Uh, okay. I think some of us, like, like I see on Twitter, like, I'm really active on Twitter. Like, I, I see everything. I noticed, I noticed. Yeah, okay. like, some, like, a lot of people are saying, like, you know, someone so doesn't look excited or blah, 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 blah. But, like, I don't, I don't really see how you can tell off a picture right. or something. Like, I think everybody was excited. Everybody's, I mean, it's Duke. Like, if you're not committed there, it's still a fun experience. You know, it's the best of the best. Mm-hmm. And real quick before we let you go, because uh, you got uh, I know you got schoolwork and stuff. Go ahead, TK. We gotta get. No, I was just gonna say I wanted to give V a chance to jump in there with uh, with any questions. I mean, uh, AC kind of stole mine. I was I was gonna kind of, you know, hint at the who who had the most fun. Um, I know Isaiah was having a blast. You, you could tell he was smiling from ear to ear. Um, you know, Coop was getting into the, to it with the with the fun song that we all love. And, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, well, how, like, did, you know, did you have fun? How was the student section to you? Like, I mean, the, what, what, what were your thoughts on being in the student section? I mean, it had to be wild. We've all wanted to be down there before. I mean, yeah, it was a uh, real fun. Like I said, like growing up a Duke fan, like you, all you hear about is the crazies and how in, in they are to the games and stuff. So it, it was like real cool being on that side. Like I've never been on that side. But it was, and I probably will never be over there again, honestly. But it was cool to uh, cool to be over there and like uh, see the fan support, and it was kind of like kind of like uh, like dreams of reality type thing. Oh, I bet, man. I mean, I had goosebumps when they were when they were calling you guys over there. So I know you must have. Yeah, I mean, it was it was very it was fun to watch, man. It, and I'm I'm happy for you. Uh, best of luck this season, man. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, man, absolutely. All right. Well, there we go. That was a that was a nice surprise there. Darren Harris kind of jumping in. Um, we we I'll all tell you picked what, up I, on that, right? Some people who are we we heard yeah, that, well, right? You know, there, okay. there was something there. There was something there. I'm I'm not gonna you know draw too much, but uh, you, you, know, there, you know, look, all we had to do, do <laughs> is say um, you know listen to what he said. Right, so mm-hmm. um, but yeah, no, I, I do think that um, you know, and again, thanks to to Darren Harris for jumping on. Uh, I, I do think that that Shire really meant what he said before he took the job, right? Before uh, his first official game, where he wanted to build a team that had the best shooting, the most assists, most three pointers made, most assists in the country. Then, like you know, you kind of see the roster construction this year, and then you see who he's recruiting, you see who has already committed, and who's con- who he's continuing to recruit. He's kind of living by what he said he was going to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how many times does a first-year head coach take over a program and follow through with what he says? Yeah. Uh, it, it might be a little bit harder to do at other schools and easier to do at Duke. I'm sure mm-hmm. because recruiting is a lot easier. and He's got his foot in the door for stuff like that. But it's even like him saying that he wants to sort of get guys that are going to buy in, that are going to stick around, that he's getting guys that are going to buy into it. And you've already seen it. We've already seen guys sticking around for multiple years. And he's now committing to building a team that is a very modern brand of basketball that that looks more and more like an NBA team with three and D players. And I think that will, you know, benefit Duke and it'll benefit those players in the long run as they try to chase their dream to the NBA. Yeah, one of the things that I uh, really took away from kind of uh, the Shire and and obviously what Darren just said was the the pillar mentality, like that is, I, I, that's the thing I love the most. He talked about it with Jared McCain, like I said, Darren just brought it up, but every single player that you see recruiting, like name one of those kids that doesn't have a pillar mentality. You know what I mean? Like that's what you want. You need that at Duke. You need it because you know that if you have, how many followers does Jared McCain have on TikTok? Like 2 million? Yeah. Like he's going to get every single opposing fan's heat. Every single solitary minute he plays. So, and in the warmups, you know, whatever online, you already know it's gonna gonna happen. But like John said, he has the killer mentality. So, D, like, what are your thoughts in terms of like this team specifically this year? So let's not even worry about next year or recruiting. Let's talk about this year. Every single player on this team to me 
has that kind of mentality. I'm not worried about any of them wavering. Do you see it any differently? Do you see a couple of players that you might say, a little bit worried about that guy? I don't. I don't. Um, after watching them all play, no, I, I really don't. And, John, and, you know, John keeps, like, hammering this point down. He didn't just say, I want this one time. He, he got on the mic during CTC and said, all these dudes are here to play. They all know their, that they have a job to do. They know what their job is. They're committed to Duke. They're committed to winning. They're committed to each other. Boom. And, and like, if that's all you need. And we, we even said on our live show, um, basically what John said, everybody on this team knows their role. And everybody on this team is going to play for the person to the left and the right of them. And if they do all those things, then everything else is going to come come together. Let's actually get into that for a second, right? Because we saw that with how they set the lineups up. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you you that is a clear message putting the freshman against the vets mm -hmm. yep. and putting Christian Reeves with Flip, yep. with Jerem, with Tyrese, so that he could kind of work on what we saw. We saw the high low. We saw the high low they've been doing since Mark Williams was here, even before that, back when you had Sheldon, like with Emil and Harry Giles. Like you know, we've we've seen this before in the past, as as we've moved on as Duke fans, and we'll we'll keep seeing it again because this is what John wanted. He tried all summer to get a lengthy shot blocking big who can play the dunker spot and do all those little things. He wasn't searching for somebody who float out and hit threes. He wasn't searching for any of that. He was searching for a dude who's gonna be eating things up down low, grabbing boards, blocking shots, and playing that dunker spot. And and so we saw that with that lineup construction, right? I mean, I, I mean, I'm not tripping, right? Nope. <laughs> Nope. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what before Darren uh, joined. I think that's what I was trying to ask Ben. Right? Is mm -hmm. that you know my thought process was that John did that for a reason, where he puts him with you know Jeremy and, and Tyrese and, and Flip and says, "Hey, these are the people that you're going to be playing with. We're trying to instill a little bit of confidence in you, but I want you also to see the role that you're going to play." So I kind of want to start there. But AC, to your point, I do want to touch back on that where he starts Jeremy and Tyrese versus Jared and Foster. That is mm -hmm. something I do want to talk on. So we're gonna let's table that. But Ben, yeah. let's get back to that original one. Just talking about Reeves and the situation that John put him in for uh for kind of like that lineup in CTC. Yeah, so I, I loved the usage of Christian Reeves. You know, I I wasn't expecting him to get as much usage. I've been a bit very big Sean Stewart fan. And I've always thought that that he's so sneakily athletic and people really kind of doubt him. Uh but I think that from countdown and it's you know a very small sample size but it really looks like if they're using a dunker spot it's christian reeves they have mm -hmm. full faith in him and mm -hmm. you can see just every time the players would get the ball especially kyle on that that wing anytime he'd get it they're looking for him immediately they're looking for him and that's a really nice thing to see because i think at the beginning of the year last year they often would ignore Derek Lively or they wouldn't find Derek Lively if he was open in that that dump down spot. But they're looking for Reeves. They're throwing it mm -hmm. to where only he can get it. They're using him, and it's clear that he's got a role. He's the only player that really, truly can play that role. And I think mm -hmm. it's a really important one with sort of a, a lack of length in the front court that this team has. It's He's going to play an important role, and I think it's good to get him that run this year because he could be a, a very big player on the team his junior mm -hmm. year. And touching back on the lively thing, right? Like lively last year, early on, especially he was trying to. You could tell he was trying to find his way. Yeah. He was out of position a lot of times. Like he couldn't tell where he wanted to be. Plus, he was he is you know a three point shooter, quote unquote, where they wanted to showcase his shot a couple of times, just you know for for scouts or whoever, and also because you know having a seven foot one player who can take their man out is going to help space the floor. But you you could just tell that the the offensive side of the ball that that wasn't his focus, whereas. I mean, Reeves, he's not going to be anywhere but the baseline or from free throw line down. Like, those are going to be his spots unless he's setting a pick for somebody in the high post on a roll. We didn't really see much pick and roll. We saw a little bit with him and Tyrese, just a little bit. But, I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm, – I'm excited for the kid. And, honestly, man, like, I'm with you, Ben. Like, I was like – I was looking at Sean this year as, like, he could be the fifth starter or whatever else. Dude, I don't know, man. Like, I, I, TK and I were talking about a little bit when we left Countdown. I, I think Sean's going to have a little trouble finding – finding a specific role this year which is always yeah. difficult for freshmen to do and like he's, he's that wild pony man like he's he's got all the athleticism on the planet he's got all the intention on earth but you can just tell in the game he's a little wild he's got to be able to settle it down and but 
while that's happening, I think Christian Reeves is going to be steady and earning time. So I, I could see Sean losing some minutes to Christian. Yep. Yeah, the, the other thing uh, I kind of took away from it, I think Ben made a great observation there that it was intentional to get Reeves the ball. I think that with Lively and the way that he played basically in the second half of the last year, they now already know how to play with a player like that. So it was easier for them because they're mm-hmm. already used to playing like that. They're already used to thumping it down to a player of that size um, and with that kind of length. And so well, you got to stat, you got to pad his stats too, so he can get that CTC Hall of Fame plaque. Well, yeah, exactly. He's already yeah, he's he's halfway, he's halfway, he's halfway there. Give it to him now. He's, Give it to him now. Yeah, he's, he's halfway <laughs> there. But yeah, no, I, I think that was actually a really good observation because I think that um, not only is, yes, that would be your role. Yes, you know this is what you're capable of. The, the other part of that is like these players have now done that for half a season and now a full off season. So they kind of know what to expect and, and how to get the ball where it needs to be, um, you know, for easy buckets like that. Oh, I, absolutely. Um, like we were saying, like we, we wanted him just to be able to come out there and protect the rim and give us, you know, give us five, 10 good minutes. But now <clears throat> I, like, like AC said, He's taking Sean Stewart's minutes. His his role after these lineups came out, you knew immediately John was sending a message. You're going to be a part of this team. Yeah. And you're going to have to do some of this stuff that you saw done last year. But now it's going to be you. TK, you, you, you hit it too. Uh, they know where to throw the ball. Proctor will get you the ball. Flip will get you the ball. Mm-hmm. He will get you the ball in the right space you be ready for the ball. <clears throat> and on all accounts, w- during that scrimmage, he was ready. He was ready for the moment. I mean, granted, it was a scrimmage. I get it. I understand that. But he played out of this world in that scrimmage. Absolutely. Yeah. And and real quick, sorry, sorry to you, but real quick, like, again, I just, I, I can't stress it enough. John was trying to find this all summer and he had it on the team the whole time. Well, Presumably had it on the team the whole time, but there was there was a clearly a, a lack of a bit of doubt based on last season and everything else. There was a little bit of doubt. It was okay, let's get such and such in, let's get this guy in. The, the names just endlessly kept popping up, and then something would happen, and they couldn't come to Duke. And it was just like constant. It was so con. It's like take, take. We've said it before. Take this opportunity, big fella. Like do do your thing, man. Like you, you were trying to get replaced. Let's go. Show them. Show them that they were wrong, man. Like go get prove it. him wrong. Go, go get, get it. it. Yeah, I mean, there's no question. Um, look, I, 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 I just never envisioned, I, I know I said it before, uh, last couple podcasts, I never envisioned the fact that we would be talking about Chris Reeves this much. But, you know, give the, give the guy his, his due. Uh, he did play well, and uh, he played a lot better than I kind of anticipated as well. So I do think, again, if, if he is kind of that serviceable role, that, that 15-minute, 10 to 15, maybe 20-minute role, type of guy end of January going through, you know, the end of the year, I'm with it. Um, I do want to switch gears a little bit, Ben, to talk about, you know, bring it back to that that backcourt. I loved what John Shire did. I loved him putting Roshan Prother versus McCain and Foster. You know, before mm-hmm. uh, Countdown started, there was that little snippet on uh, the Duke Instagram and Twitter where Jerry McCain is like, oh, we're, we're going to take the two of the white team. Well, not only did that not happen, but Jeremy Roach is like, nah, this is my house. This is my court. Jeremy Roach was the best player on the floor. It was fantastic to watch. And I'm just I'm, I'm just so happy as a Jeremy Roach guy. You got you gotta like defend him at all levels of Duke Twitter sphere. Yes. Uh, all the time, <laughs> yes. you know what I mean? Like I just don't understand that, but that's what we have to do. But what were your thoughts kind of watching the veteran backcourt? Uh, versus the, the, the two freshmen. Man, well, you, you talked about killer instinct earlier, and you could see it in those freshmen. I mean, in a lot of ways, they were they were getting beaten down. Tyrese Proctor and Jeremy Roach are good. I'm not <laughs> sure if any other backcourt is going to be that good. Proctor's mm-hmm. handles, he's not wavering at all. There's zero, zero, uh, you know, flaws with his with his dribbling, honestly. He, it just mm-hmm. looks like he's – one of the best ball handlers we've seen maybe since like Tyus Jones or, or Kyrie Irving in a Duke uniform and Jeremy Roach is fearless. Both of them just have zero fear out there on the f- floor, but man, the freshmen don't either. 
because they got yeah. outplayed. But every play down the floor, you can see it in McCain's eyes. You can see it in Foster that they're defending. They're trying to get over these screens. They want to make life difficult for Proctor and Roach. Mm -hmm. They don't care that it's just a scrimmage. And, you know, they're going to get beat out for that those starting positions. It's pretty obvious. You know, Proctor and Roach are going to get the most minutes in the backcourt, rightfully so. But mm -hmm. Foster and McCain, they're going to keep fighting, man. And those two guys are fighters. They're going to go get their buckets. They're going to get minutes. They're going to defend. And, and that's what you love to see. Keeping it with you, Ben, um, you know, because I know that you know, the rest of us have already talked about this, at, you know, at length, but I want to get your feelings on um, there was always that question about the fifth starter. And, you know, you've heard Ryan Young would do it at the start of the year, and then maybe it would be Christian Reeves. Then you started hearing a lot of Sean Stewart mentions. As of late, it was a lot of, uh, you know, Jeremy McCain kind of got that spot locked down. And then you saw a lot of the, the Duke men's basketball scrimmage highlights. And, well, hell, Foster is that guy now. Foster is, you know, putting on a show, 27 points, you know, whatever. Who do you see kind of grabbing that fifth spot at the start of the year? Where do you see it being at the end of the year? I'm not sure that it has to be locked down at any, at any point. I, I do think that Ryan Young probably starts the first game of the season. I, I think yeah. that – He's the vet. He'll probably get the nod, and that's a respect thing. Will it stay with him? Most likely not. Um, but I, I think it'll bounce around a little bit. I think it'll depend on who they play. If you play a smaller team uh, that you can get away with a three-guard lineup against, it's clear that John wants to do that. Because if you look at the, <clears throat> if you look at both teams uh, at Countdown, I mean, he's putting you know shoot on the on the floor with with two guards. He's playing three-guard lineups both sides of the floor. That's something they want to do. And I think it's something they're going to do a lot with McCain. But I do think that Reeves is going to be, if they're going for a lengthier big, I think Sean Stewart, uh, like you, like has been said already, might take a little bit longer. Uh, he might he might kind of struggle to, to find his role and uh, get to a place where he's a comfortable fifth starter. I, I've sort of regressed on my position on that. I think it's probably Christian Reeves if you're going for that for that stretch five. Uh, but Ryan Young to start the season, and then I think we'll see a lot of Jared McCain throughout the season. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that uh, coming into the year, the I thought that Foster to me was always the guy. Like I, I just, I just love his game. I love his attitude. I love his physicality, his grit, his ability to get inside the lane. He's a he's an underrated shooter, which is almost impossible. You know, coming from where he came from in high school and and what he did uh, in AEU ball. But I might I might just sit there and say, you know what, he's probably better off being the sixth man and being that scoring punch. Who do you kind of see being the most regular of the fifth starters in? I mean, we talked about this a little bit at, at Countdown. Um, I think, like, like Ben said, I think Ryan starts the year. Yeah. You go with that veteran guy, you know he's going to, you know what he's going to give you, and and you don't have to worry about it. After countdown, it's going to be hard not to play Reeves if you've got a longer team, like a a Jim Beheim type Syracuse squad. And I know Jim Beheim's not there, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but he, he, you know, on a, on one of our last shows, I said I asked you guys how many different starting lineups are we going to see how many situational lineups are we going to see rolled out there? And after that scrimmage, I think we might see quite a few. I, I think we, they really might look at some film and be like, all right, you, 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 and you, and you're the first off the bench. I mean, it, cause uh, yeah. they have that luxury. They have mm -hmm. that luxury. And I mean, one of the things that's important throughout the college basketball season is not get stale. Like you always want to be able to adapt. So you don't necessarily want to put out what you think might be your best lineup in November. We, we talked about this, I think, for sure. countdown for the live show. This is not a team that is being built for November and December and January. This is a team that's being built for March. And I think you can look at it one of two ways. I think the team's ceiling defensively is with Christian Reeves starting if he is going to play that well. I know, that, you know, don't, don't take a scrimmage. Don't take anything away from a scrimmage. In this case, BS. You can take a lot away from – how they used Reeves and they were kind of testing him. And you're going to see him continue to get tested against the first game against Dartmouth. When we play UNC Pembroke, 
probably when they could do that secret scrimmage against Villanova. Like he's going to have plenty of tests early on that's going to kind of either give John more doubt about him or actually put those doubts to rest. But offensively, I think you see this team, I think Caleb Foster starting is probably the offensive ceiling if he's the fifth starter because of how you can spread the floor, five out, you can run delays, you can run flex, you can do all kind of that stuff that John wants to do. And those are the things that give you a lot of points too. Like he's already mentioned he wants to lead you know, the NCAA or be one of the leaders in the NCAA in three-point shooting, you know they want to play faster than they did last year. 69 possessions a game is not going to do it. you got to play more, it's more, a little faster, especially with a team like you have, especially with a point guard like Proctor. So I'd love to see this team get up around 73, 74 possessions a game. And if they're going to do that, then you're going to have to do it with Caleb Foster in the starting lineup as opposed to Christian Reeves. So it just depends on what what shines through and what it, this team, what it looks like this team needs. But whatever we see in November is not where we're going to see in March. They just – like whatever, put that outside. Like, because there's going to be some adaptations that happen. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. I think I think D uh, kind of hit the nail on the head. It's like, and I think Ben said this as well. Where th- there's going to be a lot of different starting lineups. He's going to tinker throughout the year, and that's yeah. good because there's, th- you know, the other part about that is like, to your point, AC is like they now can't really pinpoint what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't be like, okay. You know, Coach K, we know who your five are. We know who your seven. We know who your eight are. We know how to game plan from from January on for what your team is. Mm-hmm. Whereas with John, he has the flexibility because he does have he, – if he really wanted to go 11 deep, he can do it. Mm-hmm. I don't expect him to do that on a nightly basis, but he has the ability and the flexibility to be able to do that, especially in the mm-hmm. backcourt, to, to be able to throw a lot of different looks at you. So – Bad. I hope I'm we don't push. see a bunch of starting lineups real quick. I just I hope we don't see a bunch of starting lineups. Well, just from the effect of I mean, and, and this is not this is not just a coach K thing. I mean, most most great teams, you haven't nailed down who your best five well, on the team are. We already know four, and right? We do know four, and that's a good start. That's a great start. That's a better start than we've probably had in the past five or six years, even. Right. Even with even if it's got with Paulo, because you had some issues with AJ not scoring as, as he could and being hurt. Like we've had injuries that have created flux in the starting lineup, and we've had Every, everybody's always a freshman in the starting lineup, so you have the freshman inconsistencies in the starting lineup. We have we have some veterans who have been through it, and you have four of them at least. And then if you yeah. want to count Ryan Young to start the season, we have five. But Ryan Young's not our best. Like I I, I I'm not like we have t- I talked about adaptability, but I do want like I do want the bulk of the minutes five players to to kind of know we know who they are. Like and maybe that fifth is a rotational one. Like and that's okay as long as those four are taking care of business. Yeah, I mean, you, you've always said, AC, that like you like the idea of when I'm coming off the bench, I know when I'm going in, yep. what my role is going to be, and, and so on. And and what, what I like about that is consistency. Mm-hmm. I'm going into the game knowing exactly what I'm supposed to do. But I guess my point earlier was that we don't have to know that right now. We no, don't have to no, know no. that. But, 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 but I think what you're probably talking about is Kind of mid January, late January, we want to know what that rotation is going to be, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because in the past few years, we've gone into January and it's been like, uh, I don't know what's happening now. Who's starting? We've had we had nineteen start different starting lineups at one season, right? Uh, what was that? The two thousand, I think it was the COVID year. Yeah, just COVID something like nineteen year. starting lineups by by February, which was ridiculous because we we played like nineteen games. Like it was like yo, like there's a starting lineup every week. It was like oh my god, this team is not like, they're not built for anything. They're trying to figure it out on the fly. Yeah. And obviously, you know, situation be damned. Like that was still like it was that was tough to deal with. And then it kind of spilled into the following season a little bit too. But then they got it kind of set, especially once Mark took over, especially once Paulo did his thing and he kept doing his thing. And you know what I mean? They had some consistency where with Jeremy towards the end of the season too. Yeah, no doubt. So I I, I do want to switch gears a little bit, um, because we're going to be talking about the lineups, you know, the entire season, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. it's it's right on right at our fingertips right now. We, you know, we're ready for Duke basketball. Um, But there is another team a few miles down the road that hopefully we can get a little bit of insight if he's allowed to talk about it, Ben. Um, You know, they had a uh, secret scrimmage against FAU and then they had their blue and white whatever crap. Um, so if you could give us a little bit of like, you know, wisdom <laughs> to what is going on, uh, in Chapel Hill. And, and I personally feel like last year, you know, no, I didn't expect them to miss the tournament, but 
I thought they were completely overrated for a lot of different reasons. I won't get into it and regurgitate them. But this year, I do think they are going to be pretty good. And I think Cadeau mm-hmm. is the truth. I think they're going to have a lot more uh, continuity with that roster, even though it's a lot of, uh, you know, transfers. I, I think they're going to have a chip on their shoulder. And and Hughes has a lot to prove. Give me a little bit of insight to, to what you think uh, with, uh, with UNC. Yeah, so for anybody that, you know, doesn't know, I'm, I'm covering both teams. Uh, I write for the Daily Tar Heel, and I, I talk to these he guys. Coke talk. and Pepsi. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to people, you know, in the, in the program, and I think even within the program, maybe not the players, but, like, there are people around the program that will even tell you, they'll acknowledge that they're like, they should not have been the preseason number one last year. They know that. They're like, mm-hmm. they'll even say that maybe we should have been nine, Maybe we should have been 10. It turns out maybe not, but, you know, not I think that would have been more reasonable. And so they were certainly overrated to begin the year last year. And I actually think they might be a little bit underrated to start I this. I agree with that. Um, I think that this team has is constructed with a bunch of guys that have a chip on their shoulder, that have lost in embarrassing ways. I mean, if you look at Jalen Weathers, just came from the fourth worst record in Division One mm-hmm. at Louisville. Uh, Cormac Ryan just got beat up at Notre Dame. Armando and RJ are coming off of missing the tournament. You got a bunch of guys with chips on their shoulders. They got mm-hmm. things to prove. And with the freshman, Elliot Cadeau is the truth. He's he's good. Yeah. He might score more than people think he's going to. Uh, his passing is certainly there. And a lot of people don't know uh, about Zayden High. Uh, yeah. Zayden High is a guy that people, I think, before the season started, nobody cared about Zayden High because they're thinking Baycott and Washington in the interior. But if you ask any player on that team who stood out in the summer, their answer is Satan High. Every day of the week. He plays like a fifth-year senior. He can get up and rebound. He's got motor. This is a team that, that isn't going to lay down and die. They're going to have a, a, a tough time um, getting back into that top three, top four seed range simply because of how bad the ACC is from top to bottom, that a loss can do a, more damage than you know, a win can do positive. But – that they're a team that that I I would not write off for a second. That they they may not be a national championship team, but they're a good team. That's an important point you brought up, though, right? Like the the fact that like a lot of times you like to hear people talk about oh they come from winning programs and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And how how that builds a culture and such. But we're talking about the transfer portal where you have a year to build a culture, which is much more difficult. And bringing in guys who have been. At, at some point in their life, some of those guys had been a part of some winning teams, and but they've been a part of like losing teams and some of the worst losing teams they could. And they know the history of Carolina. They don't go to Carolina not knowing that. Like I think that's an important part point you brought up was just how how galvanizing that can be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's you can feel it in them, man. You can you can feel there's almost a little bit of a, a, a somberness to these guys, but they're determined. I mean, I, I think Armando said something uh, to us a, a week or two ago that he was like, this offseason, you know, we've been taking it low. We've been we've been laying low a little bit because last year there was a lot of hype, but we want to we want to stay away from that. They're sort of going toward the, the era of people don't expect a whole lot from them, which is weird for Carolina basketball. It's an mm-hmm. it's an odd place to be in. Uh, and it, even me personally, I remember pulling up the AP top 25 when it dropped on the 16th. And I kept scrolling and I was expecting like 14 to 17. I, that's where I'd seen them consistently. And I kept going and I see them at 19. And I'm like, wow, really? I, I was like, yeah. I think yeah. that's going to change probably. And oh, yeah. you know, they, they got into that secret scrimmage with Florida Atlantic. And, uh, you know, Tr- Trilly Donovan says that, uh, <laughs> that it was, it was decided by, <laughs> oh, Trilly. Plus, you yeah. know, and, and, and Florida Atlantic, you know, down a man for that, for that scrimmage, but, Still, it's it's telling. You can't take everything away from those games, but it it shows you that they're they're the, they're the truth. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think that they are they are going to be really good. Um, I do not want to make this a Carolina love fest. So I'll just be honest <laughs> with you. Um, but yeah, no, I I think that they're going to be very good. I, I guess the one question, Ben, that I would have for you is: through a couple of years, uh, Hubert Davis has kind of had the propensity to roll into the ground his five or six guys and he's finally going to expand their their lineup and their, and their rotation because I agree with you I think that he has a lot of weapons on his disposal this year 
it feels like he has to. I mean, I can't say that he's gonna because he, he'll surprise you in ways that you don't expect, and he'll just keep. We hope that, that he's there a long time. <laughs> but it, you know, I talked about Zayden High, and it it would feel like uh, a heck of a disservice if he didn't play Zayden High. And it feels like he needs to play Washington. He needs to go deeper in the bigs, and he's got a bunch of wings uh, to operate with, all from the transfer portal. This is a team that that probably should go eight guys. Uh, every game, knowing Hubert Davis, he'll cut that to seven probably by March. But it's better oh, yeah. than six. Like, you know. Yeah. 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 Um, so I guess we can wrap this one up. Um, about North Carolina right now. I could give. Truth. <laughs> um, you know, we're not in the business of making predictions, you know, on, on October 22nd. But while we have you here, Ben, kind of talk about the uh, matchup that you see right now between Duke and North Carolina and how, you know, the style of play that they're going to present and, you know, who has advantages where, obviously, I feel like we have a, a significant advantage in the backcourt, even though I do agree with you, Cadeau is a really good player. Yeah, I, I don't – I think the the difference for Duke in the backcourt isn't necessarily skill. It's not necessarily that, that Roach and Proctor are going to be that much better and score more than Davis and Cadeau, but it's – a head-to-head matchup, size. Size is everything. Mm-hmm. Those two guys at UNC, are, they're short guys, man. I mean, I'm looking yeah. at R.J. Davis in the eyes. I'm not very tall. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and so you got the guy like Tyrese Proctor. He's six foot five. Put him on the block against Cadeau. Let him, let him drive. Mm-hmm. Let him use that size. Especially it's Same thing with Foster. Same thing with McCain. And that's something that Duke needs to exploit, and they really need to. And also another thing that they can exploit against Carolina is UNC has those bigs. They don't really have – very mobile bigs. Kyle Filipowski should be able to to take those guys out to the three point line, make some shots, really open in uh, open those drive lanes up for for the guards to get inside and score. And I think that's something that Duke really holds above Carolina, and I think that's what puts them as a better team, in my opinion. Yeah, D. I mean, do you kind of uh, see it any differently there? I mean, obviously you're you know the expert in terms of what Carolina has. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what? <laughs> um, no, I, I do think Cadeau is a, is a great basketball player. Um, but with the the link, not even the, the height of Tyrese Proctor, just the wingspan of Tyrese Proctor, I don't know how Cadeau gets around that. Um, or Davis, for that matter. Uh, it, but Tyrese Proctor is a, is a special, special cat. And, we, and Duke, as we as Duke fans are super lucky to have him back for a second year. Let's just be quite oh, honest yeah. with that. Oh, yeah. Um, Carolina is going to be a lot better than people think. I think we've all said this individually. We've said it on the podcast. We've said it on our chat. Um, they're probably a little underrated right now. Nobody coming, nobody at Carolina right now doesn't know how Duke plays basketball. Cormac's played them a few times. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's and they're they're laying low for a reason. It's the it's the right play. It's probably and Ben, I don't know, you can probably, you know, tell us this more, but I have a feeling the coaching staff said, hey, get off of social media a little bit. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's something that they've been asked about, and they've said that, you know, it's something that they don't actively try to ignore necessarily, but I think it's something that they've tried to, to distance themselves from. And that's only going to bring you closer as a team. So they're going to be good. Uh, but, but, no, I don't think I, – I don't think – I don't know how they're going to compete with Duke Duke's length, their Duke's speed, Duke's backcourt. I mean, there's. And well, it's, Armando it, it, Armando is freed up now. He's got a little less stress because he 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 had that divorce on his plate last year. So now he's, he's not worried about the divorce anymore. So <laughs> true. And apparently he can make a jump shot now. I don't know. I've seen some. No, we got to play the other side of that divorce, man. We got to. <laughs> oh. oh. We got time. We got time. Man. Oh we man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, AC, that's your boy, Triple B. Talk, talk, talk about it again. You know, I mean, he, he's gonna do it. Like I said, like Roach is gonna do what Roach is gonna do. We know what he's gonna do. When you've been in college that long, you've proven to the next level that you're a certain type of player, and they're like, okay, we got you, we know what you are, and whatever. Like, like if, if Armando was gonna add some extra stuff, he would have done it by now, in my opinion. I think it's difficult to get this far in your career and just suddenly learn how to shoot. like Shooting is one of those things. It's like it's cliche to say. It's like God given. Like 
the hand-eye coordination, everything else it takes, it's very difficult to just become a shooter out of nowhere. Like you at least got to have some kind of base in there somewhere where you, you can build upon it. And he, I mean, he's just shown over and over again. That's not, this is not his game and it's not the game. I don't, I don't think this game Hubert's going to ask of him. I think go down, go get your 20 points a game, go get your 15 rebounds a game, get to the free throw line 95 times, just like Tyler Hansbro did in the past, just like Sean may did in the past, just like Luke may did in the past. Like, it, and it just goes on and on throughout Keller and history. Like you're going to get the foul calls. Like, so live it, like live it, like go down there. And, 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 you know, he's going to have trouble guarding bigs on the, in, on the interior who can stretch you to the outside. So like ha- having flip, being able to do what he does and getting switches on him, getting switches on, on to guards and things is going to be big when it comes to, to the Duke game. We'll get to that when we have Duke USC, but it's just, I, I think that's where they struggle all season. And it'll be interesting to see. They, they play a lot of tough games to start the year. It'll be interesting to see in those games, how they are, you know, how they do adapt to those different types of teams that they play because they are playing some teams that are going to do that to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I will say that like they're not going to ask. I mean, I completely agree with you. Where he's not, he's never going to be a shooter. He's not going to step back from more than ten feet and, and shoot the basketball. To your point, the first person that I thought of when you were bringing that up was Russell Westbrook. Like he's not a shooter. You know what I mean? Right. Like you can you can work on a thousand jumpers, but you, you don't have it. That's not who you are. Yeah. And I, I'm, you know, after so many off seasons and hearing that that's what you're going to be and you never actually show it, it, it's just not there. And it is what it is. It doesn't mean you still can't be an effective player. It doesn't mean that you can't be um, a really great version of who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, but like that, that is what it is. I, I think that uh, in, in terms of what Carolina is going to be, they're going to show it pretty early. I think they've surrounded Baycott with a lot of really good shooters and a really good point guard. And again, a lot of guys that want to prove themselves. I think they're a top 10 team in the country. I think the, the two Duke matchups this year are going to be elite. But at the end of the day, Duke's a much better team. They have more depth. They have more fouls to give down low. They have better shooters. They have better playmakers. They have more talent. And they have Oodles, the better coach. So at the end of the day, Duke's just a better program. We already know that. Ben, I'll give you the final word here before we sign off. What are you looking forward to the most this year in the non conference for Duke? For Duke, uh, man, I, I really want to see that that back to back that head of Arizona and, and Michigan State because if Duke gets out of both of those games with two wins, they're probably the number one team in the country after that, and they're in the driver's seat nationally at that point if they can take those two because i think what what we haven't seen from duke in in the last few years is is a team that runs the slate in non-conference you know that used to be Mm -hmm. something that happened a lot more frequently 2018 did it 15 did it 13 did it but this this team if it's gonna be really hard for this team to do it but man if they can are they in the they're gonna be in the driver's seat yeah, D, D, you're looking forward to that Baylor game too, right? Up in M, uh, MSG, like the, you know, Cameron North. But that's going to be a tough game for Duke as well. Yeah, I think their uh, Baylor's length is going to be a true test for Duke, and and we're going to see how our bigs match up with some top ten bigs in the country. So, I think we're going to smoke Baylor. I mean, you know, but <laughs> I really do. I think we're. Gonna, be- it's not me being funny. I think we're going to smoke Baylor. It, it'll be a test for the bigs, and and, that, and that's what we need bef- before we go in conference play. I kind of look at that Arkansas game as more of the more of the big that one in the Arizona game. Arizona's early, second game of the right. season, so that is that's gonna be tough. You know they they bring they bring the big the big players down low, but their their bigs are kind of they're still kind of young. Like they don't have the ba- Balo didn't come back right, or did he? Mm. More Balo. Yes, I think so. I think he okay, did. Okay, so then, so they got the veteran presence there, but then they got Dylan Anderson too. He's a big seven footer who can stretch the floor, kind of like flip, flip light, but not not as good. But he can stretch the floor at least. But he's he's seven one. He's a shot blocker. So they they definitely second game of the season. That's going to be a good test, uh, kind of to see how our bigs handle that. And we, I mean, you might end up seeing us go go with the guards in that game. Honestly, yeah, I don't I don't know that Christian Reed's going to be ready yet. I think that might be when you see the guards kind of take over and where you see McCain and and Foster kind of do their thing where we can spread the floor against those big guys and make them work a little bit more than they want to on the perimeter. But I mean, we, we have tests up and down the lineup. So or up and down the uh, the schedule. Yeah, totally agree. I, mean, I think there's uh, a lot of truth to all those different games. AC, I'm with you. 
that Arkansas game is the one that kind of I have circled mm-hmm. on the road. Their crowd is going to be nice. They want to be. They want to be yeah. Duke so bad. It's their uh, national championship, man. They already. One hundred percent. You already know. You already know. Yeah. Uh, we want the ninety-four payback too on the road. I know we already beat him in the tournament, but I want to go down there Correct. and do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and look, uh, we hope that we can get you back on the podcast because um, I'm not going to ask you for your season predictions yet. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to do that yet. So we're going to get you back on the podcast and we're going to get some uh, some prediction from you. Well, we're this close. We are this close for the start of the season. Right. It's going to be absolutely sure. And real quick. ACC Player of the Year, Tyrese Proctor, yes or no? I I don't think I don't think he's going to win Player of the Year. I, I don't think he's going to be the. I, I you know I hate saying that, but I, I don't think he's going to get it. I think it's going to go. It'll either go probably to somebody that we do not expect at all, or it'll go to like maybe Baycott or Filipowski if whoever it, puts it. Not I think those are two front runners. It will, it will not be Baycott. I, I can promise you. You can't. Hey, you know you can't be the you can't be the ACC player of the preseason player of the year forty seven times. I hope you're right. And then come back and finally win it. No it's way. Over. It's over. It's over. All right. CTC is over. Regular season is about to happen. This season is going to be absolutely lit up. Let's go, Duke. Let's go, Duke. Let's go, Duke.